Good day. Welcome back to the channel. This is Show, your personal strategy guide with a rather unexpected but nevertheless interesting video on a game that I really didn't hear much about. In fact, I had no information on this game coming out until the developer, Valkyrie Initiative, reached out to me and said, Hey, we got this game coming out on the Switch soon, and uh, yeah, we think it fits your channel, so if you're cool with it, here's a code, and it would be awesome if you covered it. So thank you so much, Valkyrie Initiative, for the review code. Here is the tack review for Stone's Keeper. Originally released on Steam in 2022, Stone's Keeper is a turn-based strategy game developed by Valkyrie Initiative and SK Team, known for not many games on the Switch. Anyway, when diving into the story, Stone's Keeper follows Elizabeth, a young princess who, upon her 18th birthday and the passing of her father the king, has assumed control of a church-based group known as the Order of the Griffin. Almost immediately the game dives in and starts presenting the initial conflict of undead hordes, elves, and other entities attempting to cause a ruckus to the humans of Elizabeth's kingdom. After some early skirmishes, taunts, and a little bit of clandestine operations, Elizabeth, along with her allies, manages to construct a literal flying castle to protect her people and sets off around the world to eliminate the threats both seen and unseen. Now, in all, I do admit the story did take me a bit by surprise. I mean, it comes in pretty quickly and feels, I guess, a bit rushed. However, there is just enough story beats that really make you interested in going one step further to figure out how things ultimately resolve. Plus, the fact that there is quite a bit of freedom into choosing what to tackle and on what to wait on is fairly nice. But anyway, some of the English dialogue doesn't really seem to be... I guess mature, I guess is the way to put it. It's not, I'm not saying it's bad, but really doesn't match the situation as how it's being presented. Then when moving on to the visual expressions, I'm not gonna lie, uh, I've never really been too into this sort of visual design. The game uses a fairly dark aesthetic that I've seen used a lot with Northern and Eastern European medieval depictions. Now, this isn't a criticism, even games like Banner Saga, of which I love, I actually wasn't much of a fan of the art style. But I will concede pretty strongly that the visual direction definitely screams dark fantasy. And while it may not be my cup of tea, I can appreciate the level of detail and commitment to the designs. Just don't expect a lot of motion. This is likewise with the audio direction, which has a good balance of chill and bangers. One thing that I do really appreciate that this game has that not many others do is that all track names and artists are displayed towards the top of the screen when they play. Now, honestly, this is something I wish more games had and more devs put in their games because I strongly feel that good music can really make or break a game and knowing what a song is actually called and who makes it is something that helps me YouTube it later when I wanna just relax and, and listen to some good tracks. Finally, I need to discuss the performance. Now, I've yet to encounter any drops or bugs, so I feel it's pretty solid overall. However, it is a direct PC port, which means that the control scheme is far from optimal on the Switch. As the game expects a mouse and keyboard, there are no menus of which you can select your attacks. You either have to use shortcut buttons, which are mapped on the controller, or just use the cursor via your sticks. For my testing as well, there are no directional button support for the movements too. So it's all just literally shortcuts on the keys or shortcuts on the buttons and just clicking with the cursor. Now, this just feels really rough in many cases. I mean, the mappings to the buttons are a little bit convoluted in my opinion. Uh, for instance, to use a melee attack, you have to hit the ZL button and then hit A to select and then you have to hit A by itself to confirm the attack. To use a ranged attack, you have to hit Z, L, and B to select the attack, that's to cue it, and then hit A to confirm the target. So the whole control scheme follows this and it just feels really rough and really weighty. Um, now you can obviously just select the icons via the cursor, but then again, you're spending all the time to move from A to B with the cursor and it just, it, it, it doesn't really feel all that good. It's, it's definitely not optimized for a console port. 
Uh, it does take a, quite a good moment to get used to this as well. I mean, even after five to 10 hours of playing, I still found myself making mistakes by selecting the wrong move or ending my turn early by accident. So just be warned that the controls probably can use some improvements. One nice thing about Stone's Keeper is that this little package has quite a bit to unpack, so let's get into it. In principle, the game has two main parts, the overworld map and the battles. Now, the overworld map gets a handful of explanations from the get-go, and honestly, I feel that the game inadequately explains this for newcomers, so I want to break it down quite a bit more. Essentially, think of the overall map as a game board. You have a certain number of actions and eventually movements per turn. Within these actions and movements, you're expected to complete main quests, side quests, hitting up research points, or just navigating the map to discover more quests or objectives to progress. Delaying and completing certain missions runs a possible risk of those side objectives either phasing out or becoming more challenging. Seems fairly straightforward, right? Well, what gets me though is that there is a noticeable shift between the prologue and the main chapters where the game sort of introduces this concept in a really rigid way. For instance, in the prologue, the map is fairly straightforward. You're given city markers to click on in order to do battle or support your units. Once your castle is up, however, you can only select objectives that are in close proximity to your castle. Hence that aforementioned game board design. Furthermore, to move the castle, you're given little numbers that appear around the castle that you must click in order to move. I admit I had no idea how I was able to move the castle the way I was able to within certain ways. Until I jumped from handheld to docked on my monitor and I realized that there were very, very, very faded squares that symbolizes the spaces of which can be moved to. This honestly took me a lot longer to figure out than I care to admit. Maybe I'm just getting too old. In any case, this means that one needs to be extremely careful with their castle movements in order to optimize turns to complete objectives before things get too out of hand. On that note, every time you place your cursor over an object on the world map, you're given a tooltip that identifies the object. It also provides a light amount of information in terms of how easy it is for your team to win, as well as what you get for winning. Objects have categories, and they break down into things like allied objects, which may allow you to access some extra services, enemy objects to start battles, and research objects, of which the game doesn't explain very well until well past when it should, are also there to get extra resources. What are resources? Well, these are things gained through battles, or so research objectives, that are used for castle-related services. You have gold, wood, and stone, then you have fire, water, earth, and wind crystals. Again, all of which are used for castle-related services. Speaking of which, let's talk about House Floating Castle a bit. Honestly, it's actually straightforward. You have your temple, used to revive dead units, an area for learning talents and skills for your main units, a barracks of which you can hire new units. However, I do want to say that there are only five core units you can hire in the whole game, and you start with three of them. And once you get the other two, the barracks pretty much becomes obsolete. You also get the alchemy shop for potions, smithy for equipment, market resource for resource exchanges, tavern helps you supplement your main five boys with some mercenaries, and then achievements, basically just for fun. With all that out of the way, battles, on the other hand, are also fairly straightforward in application. All of your units are fielded at the start and you're given a large area to place your team. Now, something that's kind of cool is you're also able to choose the turn order of your units, not just their placements in that starting area. So I found this extremely helpful as there are some missions and side objectives that essentially require particular units to go first. So you don't have to worry much about kind of speed or speed stats and turn order. In this game, you choose your turn order every time. Once set, the battle opens up and the maps basically use a simple grid with small squares that determine unit size and hitboxes. All units have a movement option and up to three attack actions that can be done during their turn. Do note that if you do an action, it will lock your movement option. So be warned, move first, shoot later. Furthermore, you can't take backsies on movements, so don't mess up. 
<laughs> As for actions, many units have various special skills and talents that are unlocked through skill points, and you're given a fairly straight cast of units. You got your tanky knights, cleric tallies, and the gunner. Unlike other SRPGs, however, all units have both a ranged and melee attack option, regardless of gear and loadout. So don't forget your tanky knight does have an option to throw an axe for some ranged chip damage. You also have access to potions, assuming that you have some in your inventory and that they are equipped on a unit. You also have bombs as well that are subject to the same limitations. However, bombs are incredibly important as you can actually use them to destroy terrain obstacles and objectives. So do keep a few handy as much as you can at least. Past that, there's not really much else to say. Battle objectives can range from eliminating everyone to getting into the zone and to getting to the opposite side of the map. So I guess there's some good diversity there. In terms of how people would take these systems, <sighs> I think that these are extremely hard for newcomers, um, especially with the extremely limited support and tutorials and help menus. I, I mean, again, it took me a lot longer than I care to admit to actually figure some of this out. Plus, with the aforementioned control issues, it can be rough if you're not versed in these types of games. For vets, once you can get over the control hurdle, I can see some good engagement with the battle system and the overall game board concept as it blends some very interesting concepts together for quite a unique experience. So, Stone's Keeper has two difficulties. Private Mode and Lord of Genba. It states Genma Mode is for people who grew up on SRPGs, but I figured that private likely means normal, so I decided to go with that. And there's a bit to unpack here as well. First, do you remember earlier when I said you need to be careful with your movements on the overworld or else objects would get harder? Well, I might have been lying a little bit there. This was something that I was extremely curious about, especially since you're given a force balance information and that's obviously determining whether or not you can win, supposedly. And the game's dialogue kind of implies that you're given a certain amount of time being available for your objectives. And well, I decided to let 100 turns pass on the overworld doing absolutely nothing. And not much happened. I will, I will admit this was tested earlier in the game, so things could get a bit more racy in later chapters, but honestly, throughout my entire time with the game, I didn't really ever feel that the game was pushing me to really have to move quickly. In fact, I spent a good amount of time just running around parts of the overworld I had access to in order to gain access, extra research points and other things like that. So, you know, don't worry about your turns all that much. You, you can take your time and be slow. Um, I do want to say, though, that from some of the testing I've done, it seems that side missions can be sort of um, lost if you do the main missions before you finish them. So I would say you want to prioritize your side missions before your main missions, plus having the extra kind of loot and experience you get from them really helps out just building your characters. Also, uh, permadeath isn't a thing in this game. So if someone dies in battle, you can just res them at your castle. I mentioned the temple earlier, so it's a small fee. Don't have to worry too much about it. As for the battles and the AI, well, that's a bit of a different story. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's the force balance, and that's essentially the expected difficulty between your current forces and the forces you have to face. And honestly, it's all over the place. Some battles just felt really, really easy, and I was able to swing right through, even though that the force balance was not in my favor, or I had a very, very minimal advantage. At the same time, sometimes I had trouble with maps where the force balance was listing to be much more in my favor. In these situations, objectives aside, some enemies, especially magic-based ones, really hit like a truck, and ranged units follow suit right behind them. There's also the issue of the lack of a camera control to see the field, which is a whole other layer of challenge. For instance, I had one mission where I needed to guide a carriage to a drop zone, and I needed to use a limited amount of bombs to clear wreckage so the carriage could keep up. Well, I failed on my first try. You see, I was unable to properly place my first bomb because I thought the wall and that log were the same environmental object. So when my bomb went off and the log was still there, I was like, what? <laughs> 
And I think that in a gist summarizes the difficulty of Stone's Keeper. Most of the challenge I've had comes down to a lack of being able to adapt to limited camera views and a control system that feels like it's actively working against you. After getting over that mound, I felt that battles in many cases could be up to the flip of a coin. Either you were able to do very well and beat down your enemies, or you were stuck in a careful dance trying to balance placements along with your offense and the defensive paradigms. Which leaves me kind of conflicted. On one hand, it's more than likely this system is going to frustrate and turn off newcomers, which leaves a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. Whereas the more masochistic veteran in me likes having my hands tied behind my back as I dance around. So I would use caution when making progress in this game. Honestly, I really don't have much to say here. Um, the game is kind of limited in what you have access to, but I will say that you want to make sure you're, you focus your talent points early on, on your knight and your paladin. They have access to self-healing and healing spells early on, and it's really a good idea to get them as you might need to be more defensive and do a little bit of kiting with your knight. So probably want to focus on them first. Also, don't do what I did, and don't forget you have a ranged attack with everybody. Pallies and knights, whether they have, whether they seem traditionally melee only, have hand axes. Make sure you use them. If you're not in range of melee, that axe chip damage can do a lot more damage than you possibly think it could. So don't forget you have ranged attacks. Everyone has ranged attacks. Also, many units do have buffs that are used on cooldown. Take advantage of this. This is a game where having a bit more range or a bit more power could make a difference. So don't be too conservative with your skills. So I think at the end of this, the big question is, show, did you enjoy playing this game? And the answer is, yes, I did actually. Sure, the game has its flaws, but coming from the perspective of not knowing this game to getting fairly hands-on and deep with it and I found myself wanting to actually put more time in this world, and it, it definitely superseded my expectations. And honestly, it seems to be worth a pickup if, it, if at least it's on sale. So in terms of the who though, I would say that this is good for fans of dark fantasy with a medieval European feel. If you're into that and you really like that kind of banner saga motif and style, this is a game for you. If you're new to SRPGs, I would say this is likely out of your skill level. <laughs> um, the bar is high on this one, and, and the game does not really fully explain things in a clear manner. For veterans, I could give this a recommendation, especially if you fall into the aforementioned fan of dark fantasy category and you're into a challenge. With that said, however, I know that this experience will not be for everyone, so by all means, please take what I've presented here into consideration along with your own preferences and thoughts when you decide to make a purchase or not. All right, well, if you watched until here, thank you so much. Once again, thank you to Valkyrie Initiative for the code, I really appreciate it. And again, I had a fun time playing this game. For the channel, if you wanna support the channel, you know the YouTube drill. And then from me, Thank you so much for sending your love. As always, you are appreciated and loved by me. I will catch you in the next video. Take care and cheers.